Please take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll begin our reading at verse 25. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 25. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, and those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace, therefore, that we, may accept, that we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. May the Lord bless in the reading of his word. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18. As we have followed this situation since the beginning of chapter 17, the culmination of events is at hand. Three and a half long years of drought, can you imagine no rain for three and a half years, have climaxed in the multitudes of Israel assembling for a, a showdown at Mount Carmel, the resolution of an ongoing conflict. And as the, the throngs gather, as people have been called by order of the king, as tens of thousands of people gather in the valley of Jezreel at the foot of Mount Carmel, Elijah the prophet appears above the mass of people, that ridge. It's not a, a single peak, it's a ridge, 1,500 feet above the valley floor. He appears above the mass of the people and with a thunderous voice asks the question, how long halt ye between two opinions? We saw that last week. How long are you going to, to, to vacillate between the worship of Baal and the worship of the true God? Israel had been promised by God the promised land. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Then Jacob went down into Egypt. For 400 years they, they remembered the promise. And then God sent Moses. And through a, a series of, of, of amazing miracles, God brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. He fed them with manna for 40 years. Their clothes didn't wear out. Water was on a number of occasions miraculously provided for them. There was the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. They saw the hand of God. And yet the whole thing took 40 years because they would not enter in initially because of their unbelief. The issue is not a matter of, of signs and wonders, as we'll eventually see here, but rather of faith. Remember, they saw the plagues. They, they walked through the, 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 the Red Sea, a wall of water on either side. For 40 years, these unbelieving people ate manna that God miraculously provided every day except for the Sabbath. <coughs> Every day they could look and see that pillar of cloud, and at night the pillar of fire. It's not from lack of evidence. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. We see it every day, and we get so used to it. I remember the first time I went to Colorado. I'm a, I'm a flatlander by, by uh, my, my rearing. I grew up in the Midwest. And I was a teenager the first time I saw Colorado. Just amazed by the, by the mountains and so on. Of course, we have nicer mountains here, I think. <laughs> but I remember seeing that, and I remember if there was a fellow who, who lived there all his life. And he says, yes, I understand it's beautiful, but I have been here all my life, and it is just commonplace for me. And it's, in some ways, that's very sad, because I'm so used to it that I fail to recognize the significance of it. And Israel had grown so accustomed that they had forgotten the significance. A false god had been brought in by a wicked queen. Her efforts to make this the state religion had largely been successful. We will find out later on that there are, out of the, the probably million plus people that lived in Israel this time, only 7,000 
had not yet bowed the knee to Baal. About one in what was it? About one in three hundred. Hardly anybody had been left. And yet you can't have both. God is a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, it says in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not make into thee any graven image. And yet both of those things are tied to Baal worship. And Baal worship was filled with all kinds of other corruptions, the sacrifice of children and ritual uh, prostitution, a number of other things that went on with this. And so Elijah said, how long are you going to limp between two opinions? Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve Baal? Because there's only one God. If you believe in an almighty being and creation demands a creator, you can only have one who's almighty. How long are you going to halt between these two opinions? The people are there. By the thousands they have come. How long halt you between your two opinions, he says there in verse 21. If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. There was no response, there's no reaction. <coughs> it could be due to a couple of things. Number one, it could be due to guilt. This advent of Baal worship had only been going on for 12 or 15 years. And a great many of those people had grown up at least paying lip service to the God of Israel. They knew better. And they knew Elijah probably was right. And yet we have Baal worship, we have the king supporting this, we have the fearful, terrorizing Jezebel who is promoting this. And we dare not say anything against Baal for fear of our lives. And the people answered him not a word. I think they're waiting to see. They know something's going on. They know that Baal's been a disastrous failure. Remember, Baal is the, the god of the storm. In, uh, in Israel, you have, in much of the Middle East, you have a, a cycle. Uh, here in the Northwest, we have that, the dry season. We have just entered the dry season. I think it started the day before yesterday. <laughs> and it will last until, except it'll probably rain on the 4th of July because that's tradition. And then, and then and we'll have a dry spell that'll go until about the time of the fair. And it'll start raining again off and on during the fair, which is pretty standard as well. So we get this, this horrific dry season that may last as long as 10 weeks here. <laughs> Most of the world that deals with this kind of thing, Israel gets some rain in the fall. September, October, it'll rain. That's the early rains. They'll get a break through the balance of the fall and in the first part of the winter. And then come January, end of January, beginning of February, it'll start to rain. And it'll rain February, it'll rain part of March, and it'll taper off in April. Those are the latter rains. So you have the early and the latter rains that are talked about in the Scripture. And then the rest of the year, it doesn't rain. It just doesn't rain. Samuel called for a sign from heaven. He says, is it not wheat harvest today? This would be June. And he called for rain, and it says the people were absolutely terrified because it rained in June. It just doesn't do that there. And yet the, the fall rains, the, the spring rains are absolutely indispensable for agriculture in that land. If you're going to grow crops, if the, if the grain crops are going to grow enough and have enough energy and have enough to, to make it so they produce the grain in the springtime, you've got to have those latter rains. The early ones allow the, the seed to germinate and grow into the plant. The latter rains allow it to produce the fruit. Without those things, we will not have a crop, and eventually we'll have starvation. It's a serious thing. Baal was the storm god. Baal was theoretically responsible for the early and the latter rains. And yet for three and a half years... He has not really been very successful in doing this. Because going back to chapter 17 and verse 1, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, plural, but according to my word. Those years have passed. God had told Elijah, Go show yourself to Ahab. It's time. Ahab had been looking for Elijah for three and a half years. 
I, I, I dare say his, you know, the, his wanted posters his, were, were all over the land. He had gone to other countries looking for Elijah. And Elijah was not to be found because God hit him in unlikely places. Go show yourself to Ahab. It's time for the showdown. Verse 22, then Elijah said unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. So we're, here's the deal. Here's how we're going to do this, this competition. Let them, therefore, give us two bullocks. Let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. There's no cheating. We're not going to put some sort of uh, chemicals or something in there, something that's going to, to eventually create fire. No, we're going we're to do out here in, in the wilderness where nothing is so that they can't cheat. Put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire. So it's going to be equal terms. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And then we finally get a response from the crowd. The people answered and said, it is well spoken. Or, hey, that's a great idea. Now, Baal's the storm god. With that is he's the idea. They, they have found statues. He's there holding a, a lightning bolt. This is a guy who supposedly sends lightning. Every time we see lightning, that's supposedly Baal demonstrating his power. He's the God of the storm. He's the God of lightning. Surely, Baal will answer and Baal will be the winner. It's a good idea. And so, now here's something we understand. Under, know that most of the people who are there, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, are really undecided. They probably believe that both gods are real. It's a matter of which one is powerful. Which one are we going to worship? Which one is, is really the God that it matters? It isn't that there's only one God, although the Bible teaches that. The Old Testament teaches that. But they believe probably that Baal is going to answer and will resolve this question. And then maybe with the lightning he will send some rain as well, and we'll have a resolution to this problem. Maybe Elijah will go away and we can get back to life as normal that we had before this drought. Verse 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it <coughs> for your many. You guys get to go first. There's a bunch of you. There's 450 of you. So you guys get to go first. And call the name of your gods. By the way, Baalim is a plural there were a number of different Baals, and there was this consorts and so on. So we're talking about a, a, uh, a pantheon of gods that are connected with this. It isn't just one God. Call the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. So they did it. Now, did these guys believe that their God was real? Probably. Probably. Now, I mentioned last week that they have found statues in Egypt where there's a system of, of holes and pulleys where they can make the statues mouths move so that the God could talk. But I dare say the majority of these guys were, were probably actually believers in this at least to some degree. And they had hopes because otherwise I think some of these guys would uh, you know quickly dodge behind a rock change their clothes and sort of wander off because they know this thing's a scam. Elijah, on the other hand, knows God, the God before whom I stand. He knows what the scripture has to say. He knows, he knows there's one God. Baal is a creation of the human imagination. He is a statue. He's represented by a bunch of statues, but he is a God that isn't. He does not exist. And I can call all day long for this piano to send rain. And I can bow and pray to this piano that it will send rain, that it will send lightning. 
and strike the sacrifice and cause it to burn. And I can believe with all my heart this piano is going to do it. And yet you know as well as I do, this piano is not going to do that. The piano can't do it. The piano can't even make music unless somebody comes over here and does some stuff with it. It's an inanimate, it's an inanimate object. Baal is not real. He's not a god. He's only a god in human imagination. Elijah knows that. You guys go first. <coughs> he has no worries. He has no fears. What's going to happen if lightning comes? <laughs> lightning is not going to happen. Any more than the piano is going to cause it to rain. And so these 450 priests took the bull that was given to them. They dressed it, <coughs> butchered it, cut it in its pieces, put it on the, on the altar that they had made out of stones that were there. And started calling on the name of Baal from morning until noon. They started at 9 o'clock in the morning. And they went until noon for three hours. This has got to get tedious. For three hours. They said, oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. Nor any that answered. And they started leaping on the altar that they had made. And it came to pass at noon. Now, here's Elijah. Elijah knows there's one God. Elijah is, as the prophet there, God's representative on hand. He knows what God is going to do because God has commissioned Elijah to do something very specific and has given instructions to Elijah of what to do. He knows what it is. He knows how it's going to turn out. There's not going to be any dew or rain according to my word for three and a half years. It happens. Go show yourself to Elijah, uh, to Ahab, and now we're going we're to cause these things to happen. He knows it's going to happen. He knows it's going to happen. He has seen God provide with that improbable provision, and he knows what God is going to do. And so he can afford to do this. And this is, inter this is a fascinating thing. Verse 27, came to pass at noon for three hours they've been doing this. 450 men, all in their fancy vestments, their bright uh, emblems of the sun on their forehead, their headdresses, all this other stuff, calling for Baal for three and a half hours, leaping on the altar. It came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. He's mocking them. And said, cry aloud, for he's a god. But we got a problem. He's not responding. So somehow or another we got to get this, this god's attention. Because maybe, just maybe, he's talking, he's preoccupied. It's like, I'll get with you guys in a minute. I'm having, carrying out a conversation over here. Can't you leave me alone until I'm done with this? Maybe he's talking to somebody. Maybe he's, he's preoccupied. Or he's pursuing. The word pursuing has several, he, it may be, I'm sorry, but maybe your God is indisposed, is what, they're actually, what he's actually saying. He's pursuing, maybe he's on a journey, maybe he's out of town. You can't get him, you know, you call him, you've knocked on his door, no one's home. Well, he's, he's out of town. He's on a journey, or peradventure, he, is, he sleepeth and must be awakened. Your God is limited. Do I ever have to worry about the God of heaven being too busy to hear me? Being too preoccupied? No. The God who, who is, the true God is never too busy or unaware. He has told us to pray. And so Elijah mocks in Psalm 2 and verse 4. It says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. As great and as holy as God is, there's only a couple of times in the Bible where it talks about him laughing, and it's always in mockery. So the priests of Baal are going to get serious. They have been calling and screaming and praying for three hours. 
at noon, Elijah throws some comments out there. And then it says in verse 29, and they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner. This is something that they normally did. With knives and lances until the, gu- the blood gushed out upon them. You know, there's a lot of religions that do that today. That do that today. The Hindus do it. Some parts of Islam does it. Roman Catholicism does it. Certain groups within that. A number of others. Because if I can, if I can sh- shed my own blood to show my, my earnestness, if I can endure pain, if I can beat myself senseless, if I can, if I can do these various things, somehow or another I can, I can demonstrate to God that I'm serious. Or I can gain his pity. That's the idea. And so this goes on. And it's going to go on from noon until six. Nine hours these guys are doing this. Baal were sincere. Baal were serious. <laughs> Baal were desperate. <coughs> and they shed their own blood to demonstrate their sincerity, their sincerity, their seriousness, and their desperation. Trying to appeal to a, a deity who isn't. You know, we talk about people of faith as if that's a, an all-encompassing category. I can put my, my faith in a God that isn't. And we talk about its sincerity that, that matters. If I embrace a God who is a lie, if I worship the piano, I'm living a delusion. I'm living a lie. I'm dealing with wishful thinking. Israel's God is the God who does stuff. The history of Israel is, is, a, is a nonstop parade of God's intervention in doing things. And he's about to do something here. The God of Israel is real because he does stuff. Israel's history, again, going back to Egypt, the wilderness wanderings, we go back to creation. We deal with the ark. We deal with, the, with all these things that God has done. And we look at the scripture and we see all the things that God will do. We see the death, burial, and... Because that's not significant. That's not extraordinary. Lots of people die. Lots of people are buried. Resurrection. Resurrection. We serve a God who is real because we serve a God who does things. He has done. He is doing. He will do. God has done things in me. He's done things in you. I am not what I was. When I, got, when I came to know Christ as Savior, God did a transformative work in my life. In the announcements, we are having a celebration on August 11th. Grace Baptist Church has been around for 25 years. Right here. Tom, you were there almost at the beginning, almost at the beginning. We will share stories and testimony of amazing things that God has done. Time and again, we get right down to the wire where something is needed or, or we're just, the bills aren't going to be paid. We're going to go away. And God has done that over and over and over again. God has supplied at the last moment on a number of occasions, three, four, five different times, the last moment. God has done it. God receives the glory. God is a God who's real. God is a God who's there and answers prayer and transforms lives. He's the same God today. He's the God who was there 2,500 years ago. He's the God who will be there in the future when we have the new kingdom and the the new heaven, the kingdom and the new heaven and the new earth. It's the same God. We serve a God who does stuff. Baal is a figment of the human imagination. He's not a God. And yet we have The majority of people around the world worship a God of their their own imagination. Even under the umbrella of of Christendom, supposedly being Christian, they have morphed and twisted the God of the Bible into a God that, that suits them instead of submitting to the God of the Bible. 
O Baal, hear. O Baal, answer. And it says, and it came to pass when midday was passed, and they prophesied until the time of the evening sacrifice, six o'clock, that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Why? Because Baal isn't. Baal isn't. There are people that want him to be. There are people that, that are pleading for him to do something. But he isn't. It isn't just that he's powerless. He isn't. He isn't. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. The Lord said, look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. We are not dealing with a pantheon of gods where the God of Israel is one of many or is the, maybe even the greatest. There is only one God. And he's the God that revealed himself through Israel and through Israel to the world. And these priests of Baal, in spite of all their sincerity, of all their desire, all their effort, says there was no, neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. You go first. For nine hours they got their chance. Verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. You folks have been watching this over here. Let's, let's come over here. Shift the crowd over a little bit so you can get to see what's going on, and I can address you. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Not some ancient art, artifact that had been there before. It's just that the, the priests of Baal doing their things had no doubt damaged or knocked down the, the altar of stones that Elijah had assembled there. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. Now, at this time, when this is all going on here, in, Second King, in 1 Kings chapter 18, the kingdom had divided between north and south. After Solomon's death, the, the ten northern tribes had rebelled against the God-given dynasty of David. They went through a whole bunch of dynasties. All the kings were wicked. All the kings were bad. All of them were rebels against, against God. Some worse than others, but all bad. It doesn't matter whether we're dealing with a united kingdom or a divided kingdom. The God of Israel is still the God of, of Israel. We're not talking about just the two tribes in the south. We're talking about all twelve. And so Elijah disregarding the politics of the day, took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would hold two measures of seed. All right, let's get this in vision, okay? He's built an altar... It's one guy, so he's using rocks that he can move. They're probably pretty decent size, but he's moving, using rocks that he can move. He's taken 12 of these things, and he's built a, a pile, an altar, relatively flat-topped. And then he dug a trench. I don't know if he's got some kind of a tool, a shovel, or a mattock, something, but he digs a trench around this thing, as much as would hold... Two, two measures of seed. It's not the idea that you're going to pour two measures of seed into this thing. Is that you could take a, a bucket or a basket that would hold two measures of seed and be able to set it down in there. And it would fit. So we're dealing with a trench. Two measures of seed, that would be about three and a half gallons. So take a three and a half gallon bucket, about like this, be able to set it down in a trough that's all the way around this thing. Now remember, it hasn't rained for over three years. He's digging down through the dust, the rocky dust there at Mount Carmel. 
And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid them on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water. Each of these would be five or six gallons. So take you know, our standard five-gallon plastic bucket. Get, get four of those and fill it with water and pour it on the burnt offering, or burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. He said, do it a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. Now let me pause here because if somebody, at least one and probably a great many, Okay, okay, Smarty, where'd they get the water? <laughs> Hasn't rained for three and a half years. Where'd they get the water? All right. Last week I told you, look at the maps in the back of your Bible. And you'll see the coast of Israel is a straight shot, except right here, there's a little check mark. That's where Mount Carmel is. Mount Carmel, that's where the modern city of Haifa is, is on the inside of that, that check mark. If they're here at Mount Carmel, how far away is the sea? It's right there. They can go dip these things and go and go dip them in the sea. They don't have to be dealing with, with water that is going to be taken from people that they're drinking and maybe finding some, some last spring that's gurgling out a few drops here and there. They can go over to the sea and dip it out of the sea. No shortage of water there, shortage of drinkable water, but not a shortage of water. Do it a second time, do it a third time. The water ran round about the altar, and filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass about the time of the evening sacrifice, what would be going on down at the temple in Jerusalem. That Elijah, the prophet, came near. And he's going to pray. In English, we have 60, in the King James Version, we have 63 words. In Hebrew, we have, have 52 a short prayer. A man walking with God need not spend time introducing himself. We can go back to, to Nehemiah's prayer. He prayed for months that God would do something about the situation in Jerusalem. <clears throat> then the king notices that his face, face is sad. Why is your face sad? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. Then, then he was afraid. And he tells the king the, the situation. And the king says, so what do you want? And it says right then and there in the text, so I prayed. Now he's been praying for months and months and months. I don't think his prayer was even as long as Elijah's prayer here. I think it was more like, oh God, help me, this is it. And so he prays. Verse 36. He said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. By the way, he's more than the God in Israel. He's not tied to a piece of real estate. Where was the where was the, the oil and the flour provided in the widow's house? That was in Zarephath. What country is that? That's Jezebel's home country. That was the kingdom of the Zidonians. God is not tied to a place. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Be it known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. I'm not making, by the way, here's a clear, clear thing we need to make sure that we understand. Elijah is following direct commands that God is giving him. The Bible is our sole rule of faith and practice. It, it, it's a, frankly, it's a scary thing. And I've heard this. Somebody tells me, well, I, th I think God told me to do such and such. I've heard that a bunch of times over the years. You also read news stories about somebody who does some horrific crime and they believe that God told them to do that. 
I knew a man years ago, a woman, when he was a young man, he was in his 20, early 20s, <clears throat> a woman came up to him and says, God told me that I'm going to marry you. And he looked at her and said, funny he didn't tell me. And he never did marry her. They never went out or, or anything. But wishful thinking or seeing something, you're just burdened by something. Or you want something so bad that you convince yourself that God is telling you. Don't go there. Don't go there. The Bible gives us plenty of instructions on what we're to do now. You don't need anything else. As a matter of fact, well, I just want to know what God wants me to do. Odds are you're not doing what you know to do already. And because Elijah was a prophet of God, and God was communicating with him specifically, as he did with a number of people in this day and age and place and time, I have done all these things according to thy word. You want proof of it? Pray that it won't rain. When it doesn't rain for three years, you might have my attention. I have done all these things according to thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me. That this people, this huge crowd that's been watching this whole thing go on, they've watched the failure of the prophets of Baal, not only for the last three and a half years, but for the last nine hours. That this people may know that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I've done these things, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Elijah is certain of some measure of impact on the hearts and lives of these people. That God would turn their, their hearts back. We have, for a long time, been praying for an awakening, a revival in our country. Pray for it around the world. God is doing some great and amazing things different places around the world. He's doing some great things in Ukraine. He's doing some great things in Vietnam. He's doing some great things in Iran. God is doing some great and amazing things. We'd love to see it happen here. And at this time and place, God, would you do something in Israel? Your people know the truth. They've been exposed to the truth. A false religion has been imposed upon them. Lord, bring them back to the truth. Revive the work. And he's convinced of revival. He thinks it's a certainty. It's as good as done. It says in verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell. There's no long delay. There isn't the, the pleading. There isn't the jumping up and down on the altar. There isn't the ritualistic dance around the altar that the others had done. There isn't hours of pleading and begging. As soon as he's done praying, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, that whole bull that had been cut up. It says, and the wood and the stones. You ever burn up rocks? And the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Boom! It all happened. And there was nothing left. And when the people saw it, I dare suggest that they heard it too. When the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. In an instant, they're convinced. Now, how long is this going to last? We'll see. But at this moment, they're convinced. I'd have to look it up, find out how many years ago, about 30 years ago or so. There was a preacher in another country, over in Asia. One of those date setters said, God is going to come on this day. It was a Saturday. It was a Saturday. 
He preached to his congregation. He had material printed in a number of different languages. I found this out because I've got, I've got the brochure in my files. Spent a lot of money sending this all over the world, promoting this. He's on the radio. He's on television. God is going to come. And all those people got all excited. Big church filled with people. Saturday came, and Saturday went. The Lord didn't come. Now, the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour. Anybody who says he does is a defiance of the Word of God. Sunday morning, church is full. The preacher comes out the door over here, comes over to the platform, and the people storm the pulpit and beat the tar out of the guy. Now, we're chuckling and laughing. I am. It's tragic. People disillusioned. People lied to by a man who claims to be God's spokesman. On Mount Carmel, Elijah prayed, boom! What about these 450 over here? Been working and sweating and screaming for nine hours. A putrefying carcass of a bull is rained on some rocks over there. And they're standing over there watching all this come down. They've been there for nine hours. Elijah's whole thing probably took less than five minutes. What are the people down here? This huge crowd gathered at the, the foot of the mountain. What are they thinking? They're thinking, Elijah is God's man. They're thinking that the God that Elijah preaches and the God that Elijah serves is God because we just saw what he did. And these guys over here have been jerking our chain. These guys over here have been lying to us. The people who have been promoting this have killed many of us because we wouldn't bow the knee. These people over here are frauds, they are liars. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, as well as chapter 17, verses 2 through 7, again, we're dealing not with the church age of today, we're dealing with the theocracy of ancient Israel. What did you do with a false prophet who said, let us go worship other gods? Stoned you stoned them to death. That was the constitution of ancient Israel. I'm not saying the church should do that today. We shouldn't. But that was the constitution of ancient Israel. Verse 40, and Elijah said unto them, this huge crowd of people that have just bowed the, on, fell all on their faces and said, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Removal of the cult leadership, execute. And understand, these had murdered thousands of children in their worship. These priests are the ones who would have killed the babies. And they're obeying the Constitution of Israel. How does the world perceive the church today. They think we're a little nutty. And I'll tell you what, a lot of us are. And a lot who, a great many who claim to be Christians are bona fide screwballs. They are holding to all kinds of things that are contrary to the Word of God. We are fixated and distracted. And they also see that Christianity is, is feeble. It's a church filled with half-hearted supposed believers. I dare say many of them are not. Hypocrites are no different than people without a profession of Christ. You're no better than I am. Why should I believe what you believe? Why should I embrace your God? As a matter of fact, 
We read different news stories. We look at people who claim to be Christians and the lives they live are no different than those on the outside. I had an epiphany. I was, I was, I was preaching a sermon I preached before, and I, and I was talking about how, and you've, I've used the illustration, that each person can always imagine somebody worse than themselves, so they think that they're pretty good. I'm a good person. Our social, socially accepted behavior has gone so far down that the threshold of being a good person is, makes self-righteousness really, really easy. If my standard of righteousness is way down here, anybody can be a good person. And the way the church is behaving, the way the church is operating, our threshold of holiness is way down here too. We don't live lives that are really any different than the world. What is needed is not programs because the church is fixated on programs. They like to have gigantic crowds. Fill a building. But what is needed is a, is a faith, a living faith that impacts the life. If you profess to know Christ as Savior, has that changed your life? It's not just giving you a, a wishful thinking or a, or a hope. Has it transformed your life? For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God does things in you and through you. Are you any different than you were before your profession of faith? Are you any different than the people around you? I mean, you claim something, but as far as the life you live, are you any different? Has it changed your language, your attitude, your lifestyle? Has it given you a faith that is bold to declare the good news and salvation of Jesus? When was the last time you shared the gospel with somebody? Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody? Because such a faith, a living faith, a true faith, will change the world. I mentioned before that revivals, awakenings happen in the church. And the reason you see a bunch of people saved is, number one, people who have been sitting under the sound of the word for weeks, months, and years, finally get born again. Some of you could testify that you were one of those people. But when the people in the house finally get things straightened out with God, then they leave and start to do what they should have been doing in the first place. And that's what results in a change in society and the culture, because evangelism begins to go outside the church. Evangelism is not inviting somebody here so they can hear the gospel and get saved. Evangelism when you t is when you get to, train, get to take the training that you have gotten here and take it out there and share the gospel with somebody. Because such a faith will change the world. 7,000 had not yet bowed the knee to Baal. We'll see that in the next chapter. May our lives and our words show that we are among that 7,000. We live in a world, a nation, that claims to be overwhelmingly Christian. Yeah, I know we see a lot of wickedness, a lot of people are denying that. But statistically, we are overwhelmingly a quote-unquote Christian nation. But I dare say, most of them, it's in, it's in name only. Are you among the 7,000 who have not bowed the knee? Do you know the Lord? Are you walking with the Lord? Are you living the faith? Or are you just claiming Christ and living a life that's no different than the world around you? Heavenly Father, thank you for the testimony of a man who did what he was supposed to do, who did what God told him to do. <coughs> Father, the scripture is filled with all things that we as New Testament believers are to do. And we don't do it. We don't read our Bibles. We don't, we don't pray. We don't share the gospel. We do not study our Bibles. We don't know anything about the Word of God other than maybe what we're spoon-fed at church or we listen to on some blog. We don't read it for ourselves. Father, may we be serious about our walk with you, our love for you, our devotion to you, and our service for you. And Father, through us, turn the world upside down as you did many years ago. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.